Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, though, though they shall be as white as snow, though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. And then in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So as we sing this song this morning, just think through that, just the price that was paid. As we come to the table this morning, as we're able to celebrate and commune together, think through the price that was paid so that we can have relationship with Christ, so that we can have the hope of the future that is to come. Let's sing. And all sufficient merit is shining like the sun. A fortune I inherit by no work I have done. My righteousness I forfeit, and at my Savior's cross, where all sufficient merit and did what I could. In love he condescended, eternal now in time. A life without a blemish, the maker made to die. The law could never save us, our lawlessness had won. Until the pure and spotless Lamb had finally come It is done, it is finished No more did I owe Paid in full, all sufficient Before the throne 
of God. I'll gaze upon my Jesus and thank him for the cross. Yes, I'll thank I'm without a headset today, so we're a little delayed, <laughs> that's for sure. You guys can have a seat this morning. Thankful that we get a chance to be able this morning to not only sing that great song, but man, what a wonderful way to be able uh, to go into the Lord's Supper this morning, which we're going to get a chance to be able to think carefully about um, together. And the way that we do this is we get a chance to be able to look back at what Jesus has done, and that song couldn't have more perfectly stated everything that he's done for us. We'll get a chance to be able to look in and then look at Jesus this morning for what we need when it comes to the forgiveness of our sins. Today, as we think about the Lord's Supper, we look back rightly because this is how we're able to remember what Jesus did for sinful humanity. And the way that we do this uh, every fourth Sunday here at Brainerd is we, we go to the Lord's table and we look to the elements, we look to the broken uh, body of Jesus through the bread, and we look to the juice for Jesus' shed blood. The bread that Jesus gave his, at his, to his disciples at the First Supper was symbolic of this broken body. And you may wonder, broken in what way? If you remember, Jesus was cruelly beaten by one of the worst instruments created by humanity, which was the cat of nine tails. He was then fixed to a cross with nails. He was given a crown of thorns that was placed on his head. And then beyond that, we remember that he was even pierced with a spear. Uh, to say that Jesus' body that was broken is an understatement. He was horrifically broken for you and for me. Each time that we get a chance to take the bread, we're reminded of this incredible truth that Jesus gave his life, his body, for you and for me. He laid down his life on the cross to pay the price for our sins, and it was there on the cross he died a death that we rightfully deserve and endured the wrath of God that we rightfully deserve for our sins. In short, Jesus' broken body was broken so that our broken souls could be mended back to him. The cup that we drink from is symbolic of the blood of the new covenant, and I love what Isaiah 53, 5 says. It says, he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. On the one hand, Isaiah reminds us that we are the ones who deserve to be punished, crushed, justly condemned because of our sin. Yet what we read is that Jesus willingly stood as our substitute. It says that he was pierced, he was crushed, he was punished. Which means the following, church. Jesus was condemned so that we could be made righteous. It was with his blood that it was made possible for our sins to not only be removed, but to be canceled altogether. The cross should have a very sobering effect on all of us. And you may say, well, what sobering effect should it have on all of us? We can live today because he died for us. That's the sobering reality. Therefore, every time that we observe the Lord's Supper, we remember his broken body and his shed blood for us. And it's like we, we just finished singing, right? It is done. It is finished. No more debt I owe, paid in full, all sufficient. Merit that belonged to Jesus is now my own. It is done. And what's more is we are dressed in my Lord Jesus, a crimson robe made white. No more fear of judgment. His righteousness is now mine. 
What a praise of what our God has done for you and for me. We look back at Jesus and then we, we rightfully get a chance to look inward at ourselves. Today is an appropriate opportunity for all of us to take inventory, perhaps if there's something there between us and the Lord. As one pastor once rightly said, justification may be an event, but sanctification is a lifetime, right? And so the same grace that we look to for justification is the same grace that we need in order to continue to grow more into the image of who Christ wants us to be like. And so, y'all, if there's something between you and the Lord that you need to bring to him, then I would say after you've looked inwardly, look at Jesus for what he can give to you. And I love what 1 John 1, 9 says. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which means this, believer, it's through our confession that we find not only forgiveness, but the freedom from our sin. And so go to him this morning as we'll take a few moments to be able to look to him and thank him. And at the same time, perhaps if there's something that you need to bring to him, bring it to him and seek out his grace and his goodness and his forgiveness. Friend, if, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, the single most loving thing that I can tell you this morning is to not come to this table, to not take the Lord's Supper. And you may say, well, well why? Well, because we wholeheartedly believe that the elements that are here do absolutely nothing to save you. It is juice, it is crackers, it is bread. It's nothing more than that. I, I, would, I would tell you, please, Come and take Jesus because he's the only one who can save you. And, and I'll tell you, he is greater, he is better, he is far much more sufficient than Welchers or homemade bread. Okay? Go to him because that's who you actually need. However, if you, don't, if you do know Jesus, you are welcomed to this table. Come, partake, celebrate what God has done on our behalf. So for the, for the next moment, I want to give you an opportunity to be able to go to the Lord and, and to express whatever may be on your heart, whether of gratitude or maybe it's something that you need to come and say, Lord, I need to bring this to you, to confess this to you because I, I truly need your forgiveness. I'll give you a moment of silence here and then I'll pray and then we'll continue our time together. Let's pray. God, we bless you this morning because of your grace shown to us in Jesus. We are truly a people who are joyful because of your provision you've made in him. We come this morning to observe your supper, and we're reminded that we're unworthy to come to this table if it were not for your son. And what that means, God, is we, we don't come with any righteousness of our own, but with the perfect righteousness of Jesus. And so as we gaze upon your son on the cross where he died, we come with grateful hearts, with thankful hearts, because we remember your love, your grace, your compassion, and even your mercy. And so as we observe the supper, may it comfort our souls that we rest in Jesus' finished work and not in any of our own. And may we long for that eternal feast that is yet to come. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, all right, let me give you guys some air traffic control here for you guys, all right? So if you're sitting this way, all right, you'll come down this middle aisle here, and then as David or Ashley uh, give you the elements this morning, just peel out to the outside aisle and find your way back to your seat. If you're on this side over, just come down the middle aisle, go out the outside aisle, and find your way back um, to your seat, all right? Clear as mud? Great. <laughs> let's all stand together. Let's come down. And let's observe.
so I don't have a third arm, so y'all will have to bear with me here for just a second. Usually I'll, I'll balance it really well on my iPad, but that this can be detrimental. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Let me read to you what Paul said to the church at Corinth. He said, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then I love how it concludes. It says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. One act of promise leads to the other as one day Jesus is coming back to claim his bride. It's amazing. With that in mind, we have a great king that we get to sing to, so let's all sing together to the King of Kings.
King. Amen. I invite you to sing this simple chorus with us. Hallelujah. For the Lord God Almighty reigns. And Alleluia. And Alleluia. For the Lord God Almighty reigns. And This morning, Lord, as we have been able to look back on the sacrifice that was made through your death, burial, and resurrection, Lord, to being able to stand together today as a church and proclaim the goodness and of your graciousness, Lord, and how that changes us and shapes us into your image, God. And we pray that as Paul brings the message this morning, that you would open our ears, open our hearts, God and that you would conform us more into your likeness. God, we love you, and we thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We pray this in your name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, so glad that we get a chance once again to get back into God's Word. And with that in mind, um, one, if you're, if you're visiting uh, for the first time today and I, I haven't had the opportunity to meet you, so glad that you are here. And I'm thankful that you're here uh, with us. And we hope that today becomes uh, one week closer that this is home for you and you are able to find uh, a church family here that you know you can love and you can be a part of. And so with that in mind, welcome to church. I'm so grateful that you are here with us this morning. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is I'm, I'm incredibly, incredibly thankful for Micah Frank. I, I hope that you guys uh, got a chance to enjoy him last week. Y'all, we are incredibly blessed at Brainerd Baptist Church to have uh, guys who love to deliver the Word of God and, and want nothing more than to do that. And, man, they, they, they want you to have your heart and your mind and your nose in the Word. And so incredibly thankful for Micah Frank, um, thankful for you guys. We got a chance to be able to go back down to visit uh, Kay's grandfather, um, who's, uh, you know, at this point in his life, he's got stage four uh, cancer. And so we're trying to spend as much time with, with him uh, as the Lord allows us uh, to do so. And so just continue to pray for him and the family. Um, you know, he's, he's hanging in there, but, you know, there's, yeah, you always have that lingering on your mind to know that that's, that's the case. You got stage four lung cancer. So thank you for giving us a chance to be able to go and visit and spend time with, with family. Um, my girls are deeply appreciative of being able to see Big Papa and Big Nana. So, um, well, not Big Nana, just Nana. <laughs> and it's recorded, so there you go. Whoops. <laughs> anyway, all that to be said, I'm grateful to be back. I'm grateful to be behind the pulpit. You guys ready to dig in? All right. Turn to Exodus chapter uh, 25. Exodus chapter 25 this morning. Um, and just to preface it, as you guys are turning there, um, we're going to be covering a, a good chunk uh, of this. Uh, if you are a student of the Word, you know that Exodus 25 through Exodus 27 has everything to do with the tabernacle. 
Um, we will not get a chance to cover every nook and cranny of the tabernacle. But the great thing is uh, God has made you guys to be incredible students of his word. So I encourage you to go back and read through more of Exodus chapter 25, 26, 27, and even 30 through 40. 35 through 40, because you'll, you'll get a chance to see a lot more that's happening uh, in there. That said, however, we're, we're going to cover um, what I believe will be a, a faithful understanding of what this text is desiring to communicate, not only to his people then, but to us today, uh, and hopefully we'll walk away with a better appreciation of who God is this morning, all right? That in mind, let me, um, let me uh, read the text, and then we'll jump right in, all right? Beginning in verse 1 of Exodus chapter 25, the word of the Lord says this, not only to uh, us at Brandon, North Georgia, but even to them in that day. The Lord spoke to Moses, tell the Israelites to take an offering for me. You are to take my offering from everyone who is willing to give. This is the offering you are to receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, fine linen, and goat hair, Ramskins dyed red and fine leather, acacia wood, oil for the lights, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, and onyx along with other gemstones for mounting on the ephod and the breastplate. They are to make a sanctuary for me. Why? So that I may dwell among them. You must make it according to all that I show you, the pattern of the tabernacle, as well as the pattern of all its furnishings. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful once again for the opportunity to be able to come to your word. And Lord, I'm, I'm thankful for who you are, how this text reveals more of who you are. And God, I'm thankful for how you're able to show us uh, your greatness, your holiness, and even how you Give us a glimpse through this text of what you would do in Jesus. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to see you well as the God that reveals himself to want to be with his people, to want to dwell with humanity. I pray that that would go deep into our hearts. And so, God, I pray that as we look to your word, we look to you, that you would, through the means of your word and the work of your spirit, help us, convict us, challenge us, encourage us this morning. God, I pray that you would even help me as I deliver your word this morning. Give us grace, help us, and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. So throughout history, humanity has accomplished some remarkable feats through the construction of some, some pretty remarkable buildings. The pyramids... One of the most iconic landmarks in Egypt still stand to today. You can go and visit them if you so choose to do so. The Taj Mahal is a masterpiece of architecture, and it still stands to today. I've had the privilege of walking into St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, and if you've seen it, it is incredible, right? It's stunning in how not only it was built, but it still, to today, stands the World Trade Center, once a symbol of modernity, ingenuity, and prosperity, stood until tragically they were taken down in, on September 11, 2001. But yet its memory continues to live on today, right? And then even today, the Burj Khafi, if I'm saying that correctly, if not, I apologize, with its impressive height of 2,722 feet, stands as the tallest building on earth. Humanity has made some pretty incredible things. They've constructed some pretty incredible things. Yet, of all the things that humanity has built, the tabernacle is one of, if not the most significant building, buildings constructed by humanity. I can't think of any other building whose architect is God. <laughs> I'm going to let that sink in for just one second, right? Beyond that... The tabernacle would serve as the very location where God's presence would reside with his people. I'd say that's pretty significant, right? No other building in this world can be spoken of in that kind of way. The question that must be asked about this construction is why? Why did God ask his people to construct a building like the tabernacle? Well, the text kind of let the, the, the cat out of the bag already, right? 
It's because God desired to dwell with his people. He wants to be with him. In fact, the tabernacle in, in, in so many ways is a description not only of God's desire, but God's character all the same. You get a chance to see both what he wants and who he is in the midst of this entire building. It's incredible. It leads me to, I think, give us a main idea to help us answer that question as to why, and it's the following. God instructs his people to build a sanctuary for him. Why? To dwell among them so that they can have a relationship with him. God continues to demonstrate to his people whom he has saved from Egypt, brought them all the way over to Mount Sinai, and now he continues to press closer and closer to his people. And he wants to establish a way where they can have both access to him and connect with him. That's the kind of God that we have. He wants to dwell with his people. It's profound. Now, let me show you four things. One, here's what God wants. Two, here's what it will look like, the tabernacle. Here's how it will function, and here's who you will need. All right? They're not all up there right now, but we'll get there. But we're going to walk through each of these different points. What God wants, what the tabernacle will look like, how it will function, and inevitably, I think the tabernacle is an incredible picture of who we will eventually need. <laughs> okay? But let's begin with this very first one, which is here's what God wants. And what does God want? It's simply two things. One, to dwell among his people, and two, a people willingly and lovingly devoted to him. All right? Follow me here for just a second, and we'll get to that second sub-point here in just a moment. Here's where we, I think, need to do a, a really good job of, of thinking carefully about biblical theology. And what I mean by that is let's go back to how everything began and let's work our way to where we are right now and eventually where God wants to take us. Okay, so a little road trip here. If you remember, there was a time where God would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden, in the cool of the day, right? And it was a, it was a, a picture of how God would enjoy the company of Adam and Eve and they too would be in a perfect setting that God created, right? We know that as the Garden of Eden, where they would enjoy walking with God, talking with God, and being in the very presence of God. Y'all, the Garden of Eden and God in its presence and heaven were in perfect harmony together. Everything was as it should have been. In fact, as we've discussed so many times before, when God created everything that he created at the beginning with Adam and Eve and him, in the middle of it all, he said it was good, okay? That is how God intended for things to be. But you and I both know that that did not last very long, right? God would instruct Adam and Eve of things they should do and things that they should not do. And they disobeyed God's command. And as a result of that, the harmony, the perfect garden that was there, the conversations, the unity, everything that Adam and Eve have was fractured because of their disobedience. And therefore, when sin entered the world... All of that got disrupted completely, right? And so that's why it makes sense that if we fast forward to where we are right now in Genesis, right, God here had already shown himself to Adam, um, to Adam, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, right? He's continuing to pursue. He's continuing to save. And then he shows here in Exodus that God redeemed. He purchased people, brought them out of Egypt, brought them to this place where they are now viewing the glory of God on Mount Sinai, and, and he continues to now speak with them through Moses. He gives them commands. God here continues to push his way towards his people more and more and more. Why? Because, because as the text says in verse 8, he, he wants them to build a sanctuary. Why? Because he wants to dwell with them. Now, y'all, think about this for just a moment. There isn't a religion on this world that we can testify of that speaks of God desiring to continue to come down to his people. You can't find it. What's amazing is that God here is not seen as a God who is far away, but a God who is near, a God who wants to make himself clear, a God who desires to show and reveal himself. And one of the things that he reveals here is his desire. He wants to be with people. Why? Because, y'all, what was true 
And the garden in Genesis is what God ultimately desires. And we know that to be the case because if you fast forward to Revelation, good night. What does Revelation 21 say? John himself saw heaven coming down on earth. And once again, this recreation, reestablishment of everything that God desires, which is to be in harmony again for eternity with his people. That's what God wants. And so here he's once again showing what he desires. So think about it. If verse 8 shares what God desires, then verse 9 states how it will be accomplished through a tabernacle. Okay? I love what one commentator says, and this is once again just another glimpse as to how God is attempting to show a glorious picture of not only his desire, but what he wants to bring it back to. The commentator says, the model okay, of the tabernacle goes back ultimately to the idea that the earthly sanctuary is the counterpart of the heavenly dwelling of God. Another way of saying that or thinking about that is God is giving them a glimpse of of his heavenly dwelling place. Now, y'all, again, name another religion where God is as explicit as he is that way to show him, to show them everything that is there in his glory. How do we know that? Moses himself saw a glimpse of this. He saw what is the literal heavenly tabernacle. How do we know that? In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, it says this. It says, these serve as a copy, a shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was warned when he was about to complete the tabernacle, this is what God said to him. Be careful that you make everything according to the pattern that was, listen, shown to you. Right? In other words, you remember when Isaiah, in his great book, got a chance to be able to see the great glory and throne, throne room of God, and he had the cherubim flying around saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Right? Isaiah saw a glimpse of the grandeur, the majesty, the holiness and glory of God. It's the same thing that Moses is seeing. And God says, I want you to make for me with your people a place that gives you a picture of where I dwell. It's profound, right? Point being, as I've, I've already been mentioning before, God desires to be with his people. He wants to dwell with his people. He wants to be close to them. And from the dawn of creation, it shouts to you and to me, and even from this text, that you and I were made to be in relationship with God. That's what he desires, to worship him, to know him, to understand him, to be with him as he desires to be with you. Moreover, the tabernacle would serve as a shadow of what God would ultimately do and what we read about in Revelation to bring back what is true in the garden. And y'all, I don't know about you, but what great hope to know that the greatest prize that you and I have that awaits us in heaven is him. That's what awaits us. In fact, y'all, that's the whole point of the gospel. It's not that, that you get heaven, it's that you get who's in heaven. And that's God himself. And here he is pushing his way through wanting to be with his people. Beyond that, not only does it show what God desires, right? That's a part of his character. But y'all, in verse 1, it even gives a subtle example amidst everything that he's going to share about this tabernacle and how it should be built and everything else. He shows how this relationship would even work when it comes to how they would give. Listen to what it says in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses, tell the Israelites to take an offering for me. You are to take my offering from everyone, listen, who is willing to give. Right? This isn't, this isn't God by imposition. This is God asking and desiring to see his people give from a posture of gratitude, willingness, and love. How, how do we know that that's the case? Y'all, all this stuff that he lists out to say bring. Where in the world did Israel get all that stuff from? Exactly. God willingly, graciously gave to the people of God from Egypt. Not stuff that they had themselves, but things that they plundered from Egypt because of the cruelty that they were giving to them. So even the very things that they have are a gift from God. It's grace. 
And so y'all think about this. This is why at Brainerd we believe that giving is an act of worship. Why? Because as you give, you cannot help but to reflect upon the grace of God, the goodness of God, and his gifts. We give out of a willingness, a loving desire to say, thank you, God, for what you've done for me. It's not, this relationship is not one that is forced. That's not how God operates. In fact, that, that wouldn't be love. That would be completely opposite of what love is. Love is a choice. And God desires more than anything else for a people to say, if you're, if you're going to bring me something, do so, but in a willing way. Right? So think about it. If, that's, if you've always thought of giving to be something different from the very beginning of how God would relate to them, giving was always a means to show a heart of gratitude. Right? So this is what God wants. Secondly, let me briefly show you how this tabernacle would look like. If you happen to get a handout, just flip it over to the back side. And on the back side... The ESV Study Bible gives a, a great picture of what the tabernacle uh, would look like. If you don't have a copy of one of these handouts, use your sanctified imagination at this point, right, um, where you're able to see what it would actually look like. Now, mind you, every piece here that we have that, you've, that you see on there has a function. Again, I'm not going to be able to go into every detail, but they're all purposeful. They have a function, right? Like God's not here trying to make wall art and say, hey, I hope you kind of like what that looks like. Now, that's not what he's doing. Everything had a specific function. What's more is that the tabernacle answered the question, what is God like? And God is holy. In fact, the room where one of the most significant pieces that would be constructed is the holy of holies. Okay? Everything about that room is different than what the other rooms are like. In fact, that room is not the same as the one on the outside. That one's, the Holy of Holies is covered in, in gold and specific uh, pieces of precious jewels. And, I mean, it's an incredible location, all intended to accentuate the glory and the holiness of God, right? God's not trying to be extra. That's, that's not what he's trying to do here, okay? What he's attempting to do is to show the purity of who he is. In fact, he requested that it would be pure gold. Why? If it was pure, no impurities would be in it. Again, just to demonstrate his holiness. God doesn't need gold. He created gold, right? And so, again, it's all accentuating that aspect. And then the closer you got to God, the more serious it got because of his holiness. There were certain times of the year that only one individual would be able to go into that room. And in fact... It was so serious that the high priest would have a cord tied to his ankle. And if anything were to happen where he was sinful, he did not do everything that he was supposed to do correctly, he would, he would drop dead in front of the ark. And the only way that somebody can be able to remove somebody from that is pulling them out of there. <laughs> okay, that's why they tied a rope around his ankle. Okay, this was serious because where people were entering into is the very earthly throne room of God. It's holy. That's what it looked like. And so it it begged the answer to a couple questions. How do they connect with God if it's so serious and so holy? And what does it take for them to get close to God if he's so serious and he's so holy? Right. Fair questions. Because if God wants to dwell with them and they want to have an opportunity to see the presence of God, how is this going to work? Right? Well, those are the questions. I'm glad you asked. Let's look at this third, <laughs> this third point, right? Which is, here's how it will function. Okay. Read with me quickly here. Beginning in verse 10. Actually, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Verse 25. Begin in verse 20. Okay. It says, the cherubim are to have wings spread out above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they are to face one another. The faces of the cherubim should be toward the mercy seat. Set the mercy seat on the top of the ark and put the tablets of the testimony that I will give to you, that's the Ten Commandments, into the ark. I will meet with you there above the mercy seat between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you from there all that I command you regarding the Israelites. 
So this is remarkable, but this is the very place where God's presence would come down and dwell in order for God to be able to speak with the high priest or with Moses. It's incredible, right? Now, of all the pieces, why this one? Why, why choose to focus on the ark? One commentator said that the ark of the covenant was the most important thing in the whole tabernacle. Okay? It was the exact place where God descended to dwell with his people. The very center of God's presence was at the ark of the covenant. It was there. Now, what made the ark so distinct from every other piece of furniture that was in this tabernacle? And why was it so serious? All right? This is not like Raiders of the, of the Ark with Harrison Ford, right? Like, the, <laughs> there's not some hocus-pocus thing going on here and all the rest, right, that anybody can go up to. It, this was so serious, again, that if anyone were to touch the Ark, they would die. Because it, it literally is the essence of God's word that is there and where his presence would reside. Okay. But more so than that, one, it served as the sovereign seat of God. It contained the perfect word of God, and it was the very place where the spotless lambs or sacrifices were to be brought to God. This is where all of this was entertained. Okay, now, let me, let me give you a, a clearer picture. Like, put your theology hats on, okay? Like, I know this is heady, but follow with me, okay, because this is going somewhere, all right? The ark was the sovereign seat of God. In other words, this was the king's seat. Or, as other commentators would say, this was his footstool. So think of it this way. This was God's way of resting his feet and having a throne in heaven proper and having his feet on earth, showing and demonstrating that he's not only king of the cosmos, but he's king of the earth, king of his people. It was the sovereign seat of God. That's the way that they would describe it. In fact, beyond that, not only would his feet or his presence sit above the cherubim, which were the guardians of God's throne room, but then in the ark, which was a hollow box, was contained the two two commandments, the two tablets that have the commandments on them, okay? And that was the literal perfect word of God inscribed by the very finger of God. And so think about this for just a moment. How on earth... Do you get close to that kind of a God who's perfect in a perfect room with a perfect character and the perfect word of God? Now, I, don't, I don't know about you, but when, when all of that is stated the way that it is, it is, it is impossible for any person to be able to come and dwell within his presence. You couldn't. Why? Because it was already established and understood that that. that the people of God were, were, yes, his people, but they were broken. They were sinful people. And so, here's how it would function. Once a year, the people of God were given the opportunity to be able to come near and see the presence of God in a way where they would be able for a moment to have all of their sins, all of their brokenness forgiven. And it would happen on the day of atonement, where they would bring a lamb, they would bring a sacrifice and lay it, the blood, on the actual ark. Where they would lay it, this is where it gets really cool. You have to understand, the the lid that would go over where the, the, the two commandments would sit, the two tablets of the commandments would sit, was also called the atonement lid. Okay? So think of it. Above is the perfect holy king. Below is the perfect word of God. In between is blood. Blood of an innocent animal. And what God would do is when he would see his perfect nature, his character, he would see his perfect word, and then he would see the blood, he would restrain his wrath and his judgment upon his people, and he would forgive. Now, that is remarkable, but that is how people were able to get close and have their sins forgiven before God. Now, y'all, I don't know about you, but, but that sounds remarkably similar to something that would come ahead, now wouldn't it? 
Because here's the reality, right? Israel would know that that would be the way to get close to God. But how often do we read in the Old Testament that they would fail at believing in God, trusting in God, obeying God? In fact, y'all, you just got to turn to Exodus chapter 32, and what are they doing? They're, they're worshiping a golden cow. They would worship other idols. The priest, they, they would not fulfill their duties. They would fail at those duties. They would, bring, they would bring sacrifices that were not spotless but blemished, unworthy sacrifices before a holy and a righteous God. And so it, it begs the answer, well, well how, how is this going to eventually get fixed? Because this is, this is even broken itself because the people are broken. And so who on earth can fix this? I'm glad you asked. Right? Which goes to show, here's who we will need. Right? So think, think of it for this for just a moment. Flip over to, ver- to chapter 27. There was one other piece of furniture that was vital to the people of God to understand what they had before God. Listen to this. Beginning in verse 20, all the way through verse 21. Listen to chapter 27, verse 20 to 21. Like I said, I know it's heady, but y'all stick with me, okay? <laughs> stick with me. It says in verse 20, you are to command the Israelites to bring you pure oil from crushed olives for the light in order to keep the lamp burning regularly. This was a duty. This was a responsibility of the priests that they were supposed to do. In the tent of the meeting outside the curtain that is in front of the testimony, Aaron and his sons are to tend the lamp from evening until morning before the Lord. This is to be a permanent statue for the Israelites throughout the generations. The duty and the responsibility. Keep the light on. That's your role. That's your responsibility. Why? Because it would serve as a beacon to the rest of the people that access is available to go before God. That was the point of the light. But you and I both know that eventually that light would become snuffed. It would go out. Why? Because the priest, they would not do their duties. They would be corrupt. They would, everything that you can imagine would happen. And in fact, there came a time where for hundreds of years that lamp would never be lit. And then there were times that it would be lit. But you know what was missing? The very presence of God. Something needed to happen. And y'all, do you know what happened? One day, a new light, a better light would come. And that light would dawn as a child by the name of Jesus. And he would become the light to this world to show the people that God had provided a new means of access before him. And how would that access come? How would we be able to get closer? How do you, how do me, me and you, how do we get closer to God? It would come through the testimony of what this light would share. And what would he say? That he would be the one who would be able to bring us back to the Father. How? Y'all, think again of what we just finished discussing about the tabernacle and the ark and what's in there. What's in there? Inside the ark is the perfect word of God. Now, who else on this earth that dawned, that was able to walk on it, was able to fulfill perfectly the testimony of God's law? Jesus. No one else can do it, and yet who was also the perfect spotless lamb who would die in order for us to be able to not only have access, but to have our sins forgiven and have our debt canceled before a holy God? It would be Jesus. And how would this be done? Y'all, Jesus would be the spotless lamb that would be brought before the sovereign seat of God, this time not on earth but in heaven, in order for our sins to be forgiven. How do we know that? How do we know that? Y'all know Romans 3.23, right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But you know that Romans chapter 3 doesn't end with verse 23, right? We know that one, but it doesn't end there. In fact, it continues on and it says this, verse 24. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him, listen, as the mercy seat by his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. Jesus became the very atonement for us to be able to be reconciled back to God. Now, y'all, again, this is where I bring this back. There is not another religion in this world 
that can speak of a God who would come and tabernacle himself among his people and become sin so that you and I could be made righteous. It's not there. You won't find it. And so think about it, y'all. Every other religion in this world will tell you, work your hardest to come up the mountain, and you will maybe, maybe find grace and maybe find favor with whatever God that you believe in. But no, that's not what God does. God says, I will come and dwell amongst my people. I will come down from the mountain, and I will carry them up the mountain so that they can be with me. There's no other religion. Other than Christianity, they can speak with such clarity like that, that that's what God desires to do. And so listen to me, friend. I don't know where you may be at today, but you you may have never known that this is how God operates, who he is, what he desires, and what he's like. But I can tell you through Scripture and through the very life and testimony and work of Jesus himself that that's, that's what God wants. He wants to show you the way for you to be able to have a relationship with him. And you know how you can have a relationship with him? It's the same thing that even the psalmist would cry out. They would go to the mercy seat and they would say, God, have mercy. God, have mercy. In fact, the tax collector that Jesus spoke about was the one who came and prayed and said, God, have mercy on me. You want to know how you can be saved? Cry out to God and say, God, have mercy on me. That's how you can be saved. And what do you look to? You look to, you look to the one who died for you. You look to him in order for you to be able to say, that's who I need in order to be reconciled back to God. And friend, if you cry out to God with that kind of heart to say, I know I'm a broken mess, I've got nothing to offer, and only one to look to, God will save you. God will save you. Believer, I I don't know where you may be sitting at, but y'all, the great hope that we have is that the same beacon of light that came and died is the same beacon of light that now allows us to have bold access before the throne room of God. That you and I can go to him and we are a hopeful people. Why? Because Jesus himself is going to one day restore all things where the dwelling place of God will one day be with humanity and we will be with him for all of eternity enjoying what it means to be in perfect harmony with him couldn't think of a greater hope that any one of us will have, right? So listen to me, church. If that's true, then your life is not meaning less but meaning full and purposeful. You live today knowing what truth you hold for the future. So what that means is the way that God wants to change you matters. The way that you speak about him matters. Everything that you do matters. All of it. And so how are you going to live this week knowing the hope that you have? How will you live? Will you live for his glory? Will you live testifying about who he is and what he's accomplished? And then maybe, just maybe, believer, I don't know where you're at, but maybe maybe this week, it's like, man, I've, the way that I need to give, the way that I need to look at the, the grace of God and the goodness of God and the provision of God has radically changed for me. God, God wants a loving, willing response from me. Would you, would you possibly entertain the fact of, of giving in such a way that it reflects your worship unto God? Because that's what it's all about. I don't know what that may look like, but it may be you going back home and saying, all right, i got to figure some stuff out about how me and God are supposed to look at what he's given to me. Take the time to look to him and thank him for everything that he's done. Y'all, the tabernacle was but a shadow of the goodness and grace of God of what he gave to us in Jesus. God instructed his people to build a sanctuary for him to dwell among them so they can have a relationship with him. And we have the greatest tabernacle that came named Jesus, and he now, too, is preparing a place for us to dwell with him for all of eternity. And that's what all of this is all about. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for you and thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to be able to look to your word, God, and to be able to think carefully about everything that you've done for us in Jesus. And so, God, I do pray that if there's someone here under the sound of my voice, or who will end up listening to this online, God, I pray that they would see uh, the richness and the grace of your son Jesus and everything that you've accomplished in him. For the rest of us, God, help us to be a people filled with hope for what we know is true for all of eternity, that you desire to dwell with us. We love you, God, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. Let's all stand together.
Let's respond as God would lead you to do so. If, if you need a few moments to sit and to pray and to thank the Lord, do so. If you need to come and see me afterwards, please don't hesitate to do that. Or if your response is to simply just enjoy, sing to the Lord, let's do that. God's church over all of his people. Pray that they would be the reality. us this morning. It was great to worship with all of you. Um, let's go ahead and go over our top three announcements.
tonight there is a members meeting. Paul may have mentioned the packet out in the front. Um, that will be at the Chattanooga campus in the sanctuary at 5 p.m. If you are a Brainerd member, we would love for you to come and hear all the good things that God has been doing in our church over the last quarter um, and celebrate new members that have joined. If you're not a member and you would like to be one, talk with Paul or anybody on this stage and we'll get you connected. Um, second, there, uh, the BX has a food pantry that they do once a month for people in the community, um, and they are collecting, they're wanting to do some Easter meals for people this um, this month, so they're asking for donations of turkey or ham, turkeys or hams, um, and if you would like to do that, if you're interested in that, um, there are some donation times that they're accepting those, or you can check out the events page, and there's a contact on there that you can email him to set up a time to take those over. And then last, the Ladies' Spring Garden Party, March 21st at the BX at 6 p.m., I think. Um, that general, re general registration is open now, so if you didn't want to host a table but you would like to attend and sit at somebody's table, um, go on brainerbaptist.org forward slash events, and you can register for that. Um, we would love to see all of our North Georgia ladies there. And as always, we want to leave you with our benediction. So let's say that together. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us so that his way may be known on earth and his salvation among all nations. Have a great week.